And the next talk is given by Yumana, Yumana Krishnan. Uh, Bill is uh, my boss, as I mentioned. Y Yumana is not my boss, but reading your abstract makes me think I'd quite like to work in your lab, really. I mean, one of the problems of coming to a conference like this is every one of these talks, but especially yours, I think, I, I uh, make me wish I was a postdoc all over again. I just wish I had another 30 years of this career, and I think working... The, you know, the topic that you have, the, the work that you're doing, absolutely fascinating. I'm really looking, really looking forward to this, Yamuna. But this is good. We've got, a, we've got an image. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, it was really fantastic to just kick off the talk with, uh, kick off the uh, conference with Bill's talk. It was so fantastic. I forgot to get nervous. Um, and uh, now for something completely different. Uh, really delighted to be back here in Colorado, see many of you again. Um, and um, uh, today I thought I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, uh, a completely different talk than I gave uh, last month when I was here. Uh, and so my lab is mostly sort of identified uh, with having developed a DNA-based nanotechnology uh, that's been used to sort of reveal the chemical contents of organelles inside living cells and living organisms. Now, organelles, for mo most of you who don't think about these little uh, bubbles uh, that are present inside our cells, these are small sub-compartments that are present inside all living cells. Um, um, and uh, they, you know, they perform very different functions for the cells, just in the way that organs of our body perform different functions for our body. Um, and uh, quietly, over the pandemic, uh, this technology that was basically built to discover new biology uh, has sort of morphed into something that has the potential to uh, treat cancers by uh, modulating our immune system. And uh, you see, when I started building, out, uh, building this technology sometime in 2009, uh, I had no idea it would be used for what it's being used now. Um, but uh, in fact, I remember after there was one particular talk about 10 years ago in 2012, somebody asked me, you know, can you use this, um, this platform that you've developed for drug delivery? Uh, and I distinctly remember saying, you know, I'm not here to do anything useful, right? I, I just want to understand <laughs> how cells work. Uh, I just, I don't want to fix them. Um, but uh, usually in my seminars, I will take one study, I will talk about one thing and tell you about one thing that I learned. But today I thought I'll try and um, uh, take you along the journey of how um, we took this platform that was really built to find out new biology and, and, and see by tracing out key inflection points to understand how it mutated into this uh, 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 something which has a therapeutic potential. Uh, and so, you know, when I started my lab back in India in 2005, I was the only chemist in an institute full of biologists. And I wanted to know the answer to a fundamental question that had no use to anybody, not even myself. Uh, and that question led us to uh, be able to deliver molecules uh, with very high precision into specific compartments that are present inside specific cells uh, that are present inside a living organism. Uh, and in this case, we're going to see it going into immune cells uh, that would turn cold tumors hot. And so me not being a cancer person, I, I didn't even know what was a cold tumor and what was a hot tumor. A cold, there are many kinds of cancers that lend themselves to immunotherapy. This is a small subsection. These are called hot tumors. Bulk of cancers actually do not lend themselves to immunotherapy. These are called cold tumors, harder to treat them. And so turning a cold tumor hot now basically makes a tumor that was previously untreatable now treatable. And so today I'll detail this metamorphosis uh, by stitching together some of the key inflection points uh, to feel out this arc that connects something uh, which is basically blue sky exploration to something that uh, uh, might be useful. Uh, okay, so right at the top, because of the conversion to PowerPoint, you'll see that it, something's been cut off. It basically says, from fundamental research to something useful, uh, and that's gonna repeat. Uh, <laughs> so, 
you know, I, when I started my lab in 2005, I chanced upon this unusual structure formed from DNA uh, that was comprised only of one base called cytosines. Oh, sorry, I think I, I, this is the pointer, called cytosines. And I just, my simple-minded question was, why does this structure, why do these strands comprised only of cytosines go and form this four-stranded structure? Uh, and it turned out that um, my first uh, PhD student and I figured that it was actually uh, because of uh, acidity of the solution. When the solution was a little more acidic, it turned out to go and form this four-stranded structure. While we didn't learn too much from that <laughs> other than there was this structural transition, uh, it gave us a good idea of the dimensions of this structure. Um, and then we asked, you know, if this was a change that was triggered by acidity, could we use this structure as, and make some kind of a nano device that would give us, that would act like a pH sensor? Could we make a fluorescent optical sensor for the acidity of a system? And so what we did was um, put on two dyes onto a simple system. I'm making the same mistake again. Uh, on a simple system where uh, if you add acid, it would undergo a change. I have a green dye here and a red dye here. And as long as these two are far apart, you have high green fluorescence. But when it's changed, you have low green fluorescence and high red fluorescence. So if you look at a solution, it's going to have a component of sort of a high green, it's going to be green, uh, lime green, lemon yellow, yellow, light orange, dark orange, red. So that's the fluorescence you're going to get from a solution that's going from neutral to acidic. And we found that it could be a very good pH sensor. It was going to tell you, actually, a, a pH meter. It's going to tell you exactly what the pH of the solution is going to be. Um, and at this point, you know, I'm being the only chemist in an institute full of biologists, uh, suddenly realized that this is all acidic pH. And we are taught that physiological pH is neutral. It's like 7.4. Uh, and at this point, I was like, OK, I'm, uh, there's tenure out of the window. This is going to be <laughs> not very useful. Uh, but then I think the environment of this biology-centered in, uh, institute is what uh, sort of changed, uh, uh, made the next question very interesting, which was uh, I was giving my first talk in, the, in, in that institute, and somebody, a, a, a PhD student, came up and said, actually, you know, uh, there, there are organelles inside cells. And these are acidic, so you know your sensor might work there. So the immediate question that I asked was, can we look at uh, the pH inside organelles of, of, of cells? It turns out that you know all cells undergo a pro just they're just like us. They also have to eat, right? So just the way we eat, we have goes into our mouth and then our gullet and then our, then our tummies. Uh, cells also have this capacity to take in a food from outside form a fat bubble called an endosome that undergoes a characteristic series of maturation steps going from an early endosome to a late endosome to the, to the stomach of the cell called a lysosome. And the pH inside actually gets progressively acidic with time. And my, we asked, you know, can, can we actually watch this process in real time using this uh, little sensor that we have? Uh, it turned out that when we added our DNA devices to cells outside, there was a particular receptor uh, called the scavenger receptor. It's a protein that's sitting out there. Our devices bind this protein, and so the moment it pops into this, uh, uh, into this um, uh, cavity for this rece scavenger receptor, it is taken inside the digestive system of the cell, right? And it starts, you can basically follow the pH of uh, these endosomes as they mature. Okay, so having done that, uh, we then found that we could indeed map pH. Uh, you could just take the ratio of uh, red to green. Uh, here are uh, cells that have been mapped. Uh, oh, the green uh, thing just vanished. That's very interesting. Okay, there used to be green a green fluorescent image here uh, that was just like this. Um, uh, and, and then if you take the ratio, you basically get a pH heat map. And this is basically looking at device performance inside a cell uh, versus inside a glass cuvette. And what got me excited was that the performance of a device inside a cell was exactly the same as it was inside a glass cuvette. And for me, this was exciting because it meant that 
the cell's networks of DNA control were not interfering with the sensor. It has one job to tell you pH. It's not going to be interrupted or interfered with by anything else that the cell has. And the cell is a complex mass of, of garbage. Uh, <laughs> and uh, here is this device that uh, that's happily working, uh, you know, the way it's been intended to, right? Um, and so for me, this was very exciting. Okay, this is very interesting. I've never seen that happen before. It goes upside down. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to really remember this talk. Uh, so and then the next question that we asked was, well, the cell itself is a whole mass of of, uh, of rubbish, you know. I mean, actually, not rubbish. I mean, uh, you know, a whole lot of stuff which we don't need. But um, and so we asked, can can this device actually do the same thing? inside a live cell that's not in culture, but that's present inside a live organism. And at this point, we had, I had struck up a friendship with uh, Sandhya Kaushika, who was a C. elegans geneticist uh, in uh, the same institute that I was. Um, and uh, we uh, hired, a, we actually, a, a student who was a, a geneticist came and joined me and said that she wanted to work on uh, using these nano devices, but she was a geneticist. I was like, stay a geneticist, let's figure out something. And so she actually showed that you could take DNA devices, inject them into C. elegans, and they would go and label specifically only six cells called coelomocytes. And the reason they went and labeled only these six cells was that they were overexpressing a scavenger receptor, and they were like massively, highly endocytic cells, right? And so, uh, they grabbed uh, these devices, which are injected into the pseudocelum of the worm, uh, and we could actually watch uh, endosomes mature in real time inside a cell that was present inside a live animal. And again, device performance was as good as it was inside a glass cuvette. Uh, the w interesting thing is, uh, look at that, all the green images are gone, okay. Um, so the interesting thing is uh, that, uh, you know, here was, a, here was a device that is performing, it's the function that you've engineered it to perform without being interfering with anything or being interfered with uh, biological systems. Uh, so now, uh, at the time, I remember I was very excited by the fact that it was non-perturbative, it was a true reporter, et cetera, but the larger significance of the fact that here is a device and it's going only to a specific cell type and only to a specific pathway, specific set of organelles, completely escaped me. It took me 10 years <laughs> to actually understand that. Uh, but that's okay, you know, you don't have to understand everything about your data all at once. Um, okay, so the next thing that we said was, uh, well, if it's going to a particular location, can we change the location that it's going to? If you take a, a cell, instead of sending it down the endolysosomal pathway, can you send it to a different organelle? And this is just similar to different bus routes, right? So if I have a protein that is present on the cell surface and like a scavenger receptor, I know it's going to go between uh, Denver Airport to Boulderado and you're only going to end up in Boulderado, right? Um, uh, so, sorry, I think it's Boulder. Sorry, Boulder. There is, okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, but if you wanted to go elsewhere, you would have to jump onto a different receptor on a different bus, right? So you need to have a different molecular ticket. And so if you take proteins like, say, the transferrin receptor, there are aptamers to the transferrin receptor. I am not going to explain what an aptamer is to this audience. Uh, and so you, there are proteins like furin, for example, that shuttle between the trans-Golgi network, which is another organelle, uh, it's called the post office of the cell because it sorts everything, sends them to different other organelles. But this guy basically goes between the cell surface and the organelle of interest. And if you have aptamers against any of these proteins, you can basically take your fluorescent reporter and send them to a different organelle. Okay. And so having done that, we then asked, well, since we can reroute the device to take it to a different organelle, if we were to put this in a live organism, instead of sending it to coelomocytes, can we reroute it to a different cell type, right? And so at the time we envisaged doing this, uh, I think the genetic tools in C. elegans were not that, uh, we were using very sort of old tools for genetics and it didn't work at that time, primarily because of the tools that we were using. 
Then uh, I moved to U Chicago in 2014, and I reactivated the same uh, project with uh, our resident neurobiologist uh, at U Chicago, Pasalis. And um, the idea itself didn't change at all. Uh, it's just that the genetic tools that we used were slightly different. And the idea is the following. Uh, if we were to take a protein that was uh, expressed only in neurons, but we were to attach uh, some kind of a nanobody that bound our DNA device very specifically, then if we express this protein tissue specifically, that is only in the neurons, uh, and now if we inject our DNA device into pseudocelum, then this DNA device is going to go and sit only where uh, this protein is expressed, right? And so you could see that you could send it and it'll sit only on the, the neuronal uh, surface. And you could do this uh, for specific neurons, glutamatergic neurons, cholinergic neurons. All you have to do is use the right promoter. Uh, the second thing that we did was to ask, can you, instead of it being only on the surface, can you actually send it inside the neuron? Can you send it to, say, lysosomes inside the neuron? And so in this case, we use something like synaptobrevin that can uh, is present on the plasma membrane, but then is also present in inside endosomes, and uh, the strategy worked as well. You could nicely label lysosomes that were present inside neurons, uh, which is all very good, but still you're making, a genetic, you're making a transgenic worm. So can you do this in a normal worm, right? No, uh, and so here what we did was we soaked C. elegans uh, in a solution containing a DNA nano device carrying a bit of double-stranded RNA. And the reason we use double-stranded RNA is that uh, intestinal cells actually express a protein called SID2, which is a receptor for RNAi. This is why RNAi works so well in C. elegans. And so very nicely, you can actually label lysosomes in uh, uh, the intestinal epithelial cells. And when we were writing up this finding, I was wondering, you know, uh, you know, I wanted to place this in context with other molecular technologies that if you introduce them into a live organism, they would go to a specific cell and a specific organelle in that cell type and then try to look intellectual and say, you know, look at where our study is. And I couldn't find any. This was the problem. Uh, I was able to find, uh, look at that, actually green turns blacker. So this is green fluorescence protein. Uh, and so... Uh, so uh, it, green fluorescence protein can actually label a specific organelle in a specific cell type, but again, it has to be genetically encoded. Uh, all of these other technologies, I know uh, you can now achieve cell specificity, but you can't achieve organelle level specificity. Uh, uh, viruses actually uh, are the only ones that achieve both cell type specificity and organelle uh, specificity. And so this places DNA nano devices in a vanishingly small number of molecular technologies with which you can achieve sort of hyper-specific uh, biological targeting. And so um, uh, we then asked, okay, this is great. You can now send these devices wherever you want to. Can you actually map anything other than pH? Uh, and so, uh, which is why I, I moved to a chemistry department in the University of Chicago because chemists actually have invented a whole range of stunning chemistries, uh, small molecules that light up when they come into contact with uh, ions, reactive species, et cetera. The only problem is if you add these dye to cells, they'll paint the whole cell, right? So you don't get uh, organelle-specific information. Green fluorescence protein, you'll be basically be able to mark your organelle, but you're very limited in terms of the kinds of chemical maps that you can get. With our DNA reporters, you can actually get the best of both worlds, right? You can uh, get, take these chemistries, make them quantitative by having a ratiometric uh, a dye, uh, making them ratiometric, and you have a robust uh, localization inside an organelle of interest. It's going to stay there for a while. DNA is negatively charged. It's not going to bust through the organelle. And so uh, following this, there was a burst of sensors from our lab um, on this, and we showed that we could basically uh, sense a whole range of ions, reactive species, enzymes, membrane potential, and I think this only happened because 
at all at once there was a group of very uh, sort of joyously crazy students who all joined together at the same time and they fed off each other's madness. Uh, and, uh, um, and then we showed that uh, you could really um, uh, nicely chemically map a whole range of organelles. Uh, and the next question that we asked here was, this is very nice, but you can get, you can clearly map this chemical state of the organelle, but what is the significance? Does it actually reflect organelle state in some way? Um, and so for this, I'm going to uh, remind you of this organelle that is called the stomach of the cell, uh, the lysosome. Uh, normally it's spherical, right? But in certain kinds of immune cells, uh, this spherical lysosome will suddenly become very tubular in case the immune cell is sort of inflamed or it suddenly gets starved, right? Um, and I just <laughs> wondered, you know, why does the cell need two different shapes of the same organelle, right? You have the same ions that are present inside, same kinds of enzymes that are present inside. Why, why should the shape change? Um, and the reason we were able to ask this question was, uh, Bhavya in my lab was looking for a way to get to the ER, an endoplasmic reticulum, uh, the ER, not the hospital. Uh, uh, and so uh, what she, she found was there was an aptamer uh, to uh, some DNA damaged proteins that are also found on the cell surface. What it turned out to do was activate a particular signaling pathway that caused these vesicular lysosomes to tubulate. I won't belabor the, uh, what the pathway is, but what we could then, what we then realized was that we can stick on our devices out here uh, and then actually map the chemical state of the organelle when it's tubular and vesicular. Uh, what we found was that um, uh, these, all along these tubular lysosomes, there was a very nice calcium gradient. And the opposite direction, there was a pH gradient. Uh, and I sent Bhavya away saying, I think this is all an artifact. Uh, but then she did some really beautiful experiments to show that it wasn't. And then finally came to me with a paper saying that actually these gradients had been theoretically predicted already. <laughs> and we had found, uh, we'd actually established them. Uh, the other thing that she found was in these tubular lysosomes, degradation or the proteolytic ability of the lysosome was heavily compromised. So they were very, very, uh, sort of milder versions of, uh, they were not highly digestive as these, um, as these vesicular lysosomes were. Uh, and so clearly the chemical map that is present inside these tubular lysosomes is able to tell you, chemically differentiate, you know, shapes of an organelle to actually the biochemical activity within the organelle. Okay, that's really nice, but, uh, you know, does it do anything to the cell, right? If you have an organelle with a different uh, uh, functionality, uh, how does that help uh, the, uh, the whole cell? Um, the, uh, the interesting thing here was uh, that if you look at, um, uh, let me take a minute to tell you what uh, the, the concept that I'm trying to articulate here. So let's take an immune cell, right? Um, like a macrophage. A uh, macrophage basically means big eater. Its job is to eat. So therefore, the functional part of an eater is the stomach, right? Which is the lysosome. So under normal conditions, you have an organelle which is in the resting state, right? And everybody knows, biologists have already shown that cell state is connected to cell function. So if, it, if the cell encounters a pathogen, it's going to mount an inflammation, uh, its transcription program is going to change, the cell state is going to change. If it is starving, it's going to upregulate a process called autophagy, where it starts cannibalizing itself. Um, and the organelles uh, also rise uh, to meet this challenge. They will remodel. Uh, people like Sergio Grinstein and David Sabatini have shown that, uh, you know, organelle state basically changes uh, to uh, help organelles uh, function or new function to help the cells new function, right? Uh, we are asking a slightly different, asking this question slightly differently. If I modulate organelle state first, can I change cell state, right? Uh, is there a direct hotline between organelle state and cell state, as opposed to organelle states simply responding to cell state? Okay, why are we saying this? Well, once the pathogen is cleared or once I now get food, 
the cell has to go back from this uh, altered state now into its resting state, right? Who is going to give that signal? It has to come from the organelle. So this is what we hypothesize. Uh, so anyway, what I asked Bhavya to do was to just try and see, you know, is there any, are you seeing any phenotypic differences in these macrophages? Because uh, if you've tubulated their lysosome, do they suddenly, are they inflamed? Are they autophagic? He came back and said, sorry, actually neither happens. Uh, and we were a little bit disappointed because we didn't have a chemical way to trigger autophagy or chemical way to trigger uh, uh, lysosomes, uh, trigger inflammation. Uh, but then what we found was these macrophages had suddenly become highly phagocytic, right? They became extremely uh, sort of gulpy, you know, just uh, taking in much more of uh, uh, the content outside. So showing that actually you had changed cell behavior by simply tubulating uh, lysosomes. So at least you're able to control uh, cell behavior in one way. All right, and this brings me to the final uh, part of, of the talk, which is if you can change cell state, can you change uh, organism physiology? And so at the time that Bhavya and Kasturi were sort of using these devices to sort of look at proteolysis, uh, we had developed a catapsin sensor, and you know we had one of these talks, uh, or one of these conf not conferences, like meetings of PIs between chemistry and biology that were orchestrated by the deans in New Chicago. Nothing ever comes of these meetings. Uh, you know, chemists will come and talk about their work, biologists, and they're hoping that there'll be some collaborations. So <laughs> I came and talked about this catapsin sensor, and then. Uh, this was the one time and the only time that actually that meeting proved to be useful. Uh, Lev uh, was sitting in the audience and came to me and said, and Lev was actually just one floor above me. He came and said, uh, hey, Yamuna, I've been looking at what makes macrophages different, right? And there are actually two, and many types of macrophages, two broad types of macrophages uh, are basically M1 macrophages and M2 macrophages. For people who don't think about these uh, cell types uh, often, uh, M1 macrophages are sort of loudmouths. They sort of eat stuff and then they throw up a little bit and then uh, rub it all over the cell surface. Uh, sorry about that image for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but basically telling everybody, hey, come here, look what I ate, right? And that, hey, come here is calling T cells, right? Uh, so uh, M1 macrophages are all about being able to communicate to T cells and say who they ate. Right, or what they just ate. Um, M2 macrophages, these are silent killers. These are, shh, they don't want to tell anybody what they ate because they just ate self, that is your own cells, right? And so uh, these guys digest everything right down to amino acids. They, you will never know what they just ate. And you, the reason you don't want to know that is uh, once T cells can recognize what an M2 macrophage has just eaten, then you will basically get autoimmune disease. So uh, there are these two types, and they're both important for different reasons. I have somehow knotted myself to the table. Uh, okay. <laughs> Somebody should make these women friendly, you know? Uh, so, uh, and so, uh, okay, no, I forgot what I was gonna say. Uh, so, um, so now you have uh, these two types of macrophages, and Lev said, uh, look, your catepsin, we find, through proteomics that these M2 macrophages, which are really bad for cancer, have a very high amount of catepsin, cysteine proteases. Can we use your um, uh, catepsin sensor to just look and see where this catepsin activity is coming from? Is it from the outside of the cell? Is it from the li lysosomes? And then we gave him his, uh, this catepsin sensor and, and he basically showed that uh, indeed, uh, the uh, catepsin activity, the high catepsin activity in M2 macrophages was all inside uh, these lysosomes of M2 macrophages. And I thought that that would be enough and would send Lev away. But then he came back and he asked me, you know, Yamuna, can we make a catepsin inhibitor? Because if we have an inhibitor, then we can shut off catepsin activity inside M2 macrophages maybe make them more like M1 macrophages. And if that happens, then you can call T cells to the tumor and you might be able to get rid of the tumor. And I was like, Lev, you're talking therapeutics. You know, I'm an imaging person. 
this is not going to work, okay? Uh, the reason being that, uh, A, uh, if you want to image something, you just have to send a few molecules to that particular location. You have a sensitive enough camera, you can read out what you want to see. But when you're talking therapeutics, uh, there are three problems, right? Delivery, delivery, and delivery. <laughs> you need to get enough to the right place, right? Um, and for me, if you are injecting it into an organism like a mouse, you have so many macrophages, tissue-associated macrophages in every organ, right? So uh, how do you know that you're going to go only to your tumor-associated macrophages? And how do you know that you'll be able to get enough there to shut off catapsin activity? So I said, Lev, this is a pipe dream. Please go away. Um, so then, you know, credit to Lev, he didn't give up. He came back with more data, and what he showed was that uh, he took a mouse that, was la that did not have a molecule called TFEB in, um, in only its macrophages, right? And TFEB is a molecule that produces a whole lot of lysosomes. So genetically, he knocked down the proteolytic activity of a cell uh, by preventing it, the cell from making more lysosomes on the whole, right? And he showed that in three different tumor models that this indeed worked. I don't know why this is going on happening. Uh, that this indeed worked, the tumors were not growing, and so I was like, okay, let's try and see if we can, uh, if we can make something of this. But even before I had said anything, uh, Chang and Kaz had already had this conversation. I have a feeling they already did the experiment, and then Lev had to come and tell me about it. Uh, and so, uh, so what happened was they, they made this device. Lev's rationale was the following that uh, DNA devices would go and um, straight to tumor-associated macrophages and, um, and, and to lysosomes out here and inhibit catepsin activity. And you know, in a month of all, you, know, you could take a, in a whole month of Sundays, I would never have predicted this, uh, that our DNA nano devices went specifically to lysosomes that were present in tumor-associated macrophages. Uh, we showed that uh, they actually localize in lysosomes very nicely, uh, highly specific to tumor-associated macrophages, and thereafter, whatever Lev said would happen actually happened, which is uh, that, uh, indeed, uh, uh, that amount of DNA was sufficient to convert this hyper-degradation of lysosomes, uh, of uh, lysosomal hyperdegradation of antigens now into sort of this polite snipping, right? Uh, because the, this organism now has like stones in its stomach. Uh, so you have enough antigen that's being presented on the cell surface. And that resulted in uh, uh, T cells basically coming in very nicely and, and uh, tumors actually fail to grow. Uh, if you uh, actually add, do this with low dose cyclophosphamide, uh, which causes tumor cells to die and provide more antigen and then treat with our DNA device, you actually see that tumors actually fail to grow. And people who've been in cancer for a while are very um, said that this has promise. Uh, in full disclosure, this has now resulted in uh, a formation of a therapeutics company called Macrologic. And so with this, you know, many of us are, are, are familiar with drug targeting where drugs are targeted and enriched at a tissue of interest, right? And uh, this is because, as mo most of you know, more drug becomes available at the site where it's needed, and you have less side effects from it hitting places where it's not needed. Uh, and I've just shown you that many cellular processes are controlled at the level of organelles, and I've also shown you there's actually a direct line of communication between the organelle and the cell state you can actually access the organelles inside because topologically it's identical to the, um, to the extracellular milieu, so you don't have to bust across membranes, right? You just have to figure out a way to get into that organelle and manipulate it. Then you can activate a hotline to the nucleus and change cell state. And so our work so far has led me to posit that I think that there'll be much to gain uh, if we start looking at, um, if we achieve a sort of an additional layer of drug targeting where we are not only targeting a cell type of interest, but actually an organelle therein. Um, and uh, I also posit that we will all have to start viewing cells the way cell biologists always have with their organelles. If, uh, if we are to sort of 
uh, solve the next set of currently intractable problems. Uh, and uh, I'm going to quickly sign off saying that all of this was funded uh, uh, without a dollar of federal funding, actually. Uh, but uh, uh, once all of this was done, uh, uh, very kindly, NIH uh, stepped in last year to amplify its capability. So I thank them for supporting our future work and uh, very happy to take any questions if you have. What a tour de force. That was, I have to say, I think you've been phenomenally unsuccessful in trying to do nothing useful. <laughs> Carry on trying to do nothing useful because... Yeah, for unusual, okay. for useless science. <laughs> so, so we open to, uh, to questions from the audience and indeed online at the back. Simon, can I stand up? I can't sit down. Yeah, sure. Let's both stand up. Yeah, thank you very much. This was uh, very interesting. Um, but why do these molecules go to the macrophages in the tumor, specifically? That's a very good question. So macrophages actually have a huge number of scavenger receptors, right? Uh, there are about 20 different kinds of scavenger receptors. Um, we still haven't figured out what are the scavenger receptors that are present on macrophages that are the main players. We, we know one or two. Uh, but the interesting thing is, uh, T cells express scavenger receptors. Dendritic cells express scavenger receptors. Most every immune cell and many, the only cell that doesn't actually express scavenger receptors is the neuron, but nearly every other cell does. Uh, it's going to be five or six of, of the different, of the 20 um, uh, kinds of scavenger receptors that are there. What decides who's going to eat more of the DNA nano device? See, all of these uh, scavenger receptors are anionic, right? Some will endocytose DNA better than others. One is the KD of binding, right, uh, for DNA. The second is the expression level of that receptor on the cell surface. And the third is the processivity. In one hour, how many times does a single receptor cycle back and forth? These are three things are the ones that decide who is the main player at getting uh, devices into a particular cell type? So at the moment, we're trying to sort of drill down to find out who are the key players on macrophages and how do we engineer devices to go to, say, T cells or to dendritic cells using this. So I have a question for yes. you. I'm a simple soul, so you kind of sold me at after about five minutes with the pH sensor in endolysosomal system. We would re I mean, that is such an important pathway for drug discovery, especially in neurodegeneration. Yes. Have you used that cell mo that in a cell model for true drug, high throughput drug screening? It seems to me to be eminently uh, appropriate. That's a great question. Uh, so in full disclosure, I have a company uh, that is a diagnostics company that's using this to profile the lysosomal ecosystem to, it's called Essia Inc. Uh, to, um, uh, to actually uh, chemically phenotype uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, Huntington's. So actually, you can distinguish between the various dementias chemically already uh, using this. However, I understood your point about drug screening and drug discovery. So we, uh, SCL, which is this company, already has uh, uh, looking, uh, they're, they're helping Merck, Novartis, uh, Genentech, uh, Ab. Abvi and a couple of other companies I can't think of the top of my head. Uh, each of them have different uh, lysosomal targets in neurodegeneration uh, that they are interested in getting inhibitors to. Uh, some of them inhibit lysosomal calcium, as well as uh, you know looking for pH changes as well. Uh, so that's definitely ongoing, mm -hmm. and they are actually partnering in terms of research assays. Uh, with these companies to do that. So if I could just ask the audience to talk amongst themselves, <laughs> continue that, <laughs> just, just bear with us for a moment, and continue that discussion. Yes. So we think, yes. so I'm pretty sure, yes. that um, you can make subsets of people with Alzheimer's disease, yes. just as uh, Bill yes. was talking about, yes. 
Um, and that subset seems yes. to be in terms of their response to beta yes. amyloid. Yes. Now, I'm betting yes. that a large part of that is how microglia, which are the brain's Absolutely. macrophage, deal with uh, A-beta peptides. Yes. So we're beginning to explore that, yes. but we lack the tools yes, to be I able... Yes, I know. <laughs> so can, can we have a little conversation, yes. please? <laughs> so you and I need to be talking the rest of the evening, uh, preferably with a drink, uh, uh, but uh, there's a lot to say here, um, except that I think the lysosomal ecosystem uh, breaks in different ways, in different neurodegenerative diseases, and at the moment, people have been looking at lysosomes as like a, you know, it's a correlate or whatever. But actually it's very interesting. I think all of these neurodegenerative diseases are very siloed uh, between each other. Uh, if you're looking at lysosomal storage disorders, these are genetic defects. And uh, it's basically neurological diseases on fast forward, right. whereas all of the, the ancient, the, the, the dementias, uh, you have a small lysosomal burden that's carried over, this is our hypothesis of our company, it's a, it's a small burden that's carried for a long time, you have a small metabolic shift with age, and then it all starts breaking down. And a system will break in very many different ways. Like if you look at a car, there are certain ways that it breaks. And the way that it breaks, if you can phenotype, if you can chemotype it, you have a way by which you can already distinguish not just Alzheimer's from Parkinson's. My dream is that we will not, we will stop treating Alzheimer's disease as a single disease uh, or Parkinson's disease as a single disease, right? That you will be able to see chemotypes and hopefully, actually, since the cells are still alive, actually see responsivity to a that particular chemical. Uh, but it's a long vision. Uh, yes. Well, it may be coming at us quite quickly, I suspect. <laughs> and that was a fantastic talk. I think we need to stop for coffee. Thanks to both of our speakers. What a great start to the meeting. <laughs>